Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. So hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the Authors of the Pacific Northwest. And this episode, I have the privilege of introducing you to an author that I'm just thrilled to talk to. Her name is Catherine Keith. So Catherine, say hello to the listeners. Hello to everyone from above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. So she jumped in to tell you guys she's a special guest with us. And Catherine is actually hailing from all the way up north Alaska, which is the beauty of podcasting is that I can talk with authors from all over. (laughs) So it's pretty exciting. So again, tell us where you're at, Catherine. I'm in a town called Kotzebue, Alaska, which is on the northwest coast uh, on the ocean uh, above the Arctic Circle. And our town is about 3,500 people. Oh, my heavens. Wow. Okay. And it's um, up north enough that it's dark most part of the year in the winter. Am I correct? Yeah, we have technically one day where the sun doesn't come up in the winter. But it works out pretty well because in the summer, we actually get three weeks where the sun doesn't set. So Mm -hmm. I feel Mm -hmm. we have a fairly good... You have a uh, little bit of balance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's fascinating. So my husband's been to Alaska um, often, a couple of times. I have not. So it's on my huge bucket list. I have a very good friend that... um, befriended me when I was a young mother. She's an Inuit um, Alaskan and she lived here in the Northwest with us. And when I first started having kids, she was, um, would come over off and taught me how to bake bread and all sorts of wonderful things. And then she moved back up. Um, And so I have it on my bucket list to go visit Molly up there and visit her family and her people. (laughs) It'd be so wonderful. You will Um, not regret it. Oh, I don't think so. I kind of have a feeling, except that I don't like the cold that much. I, I think I would love Alaska, except I'm not a cold fanatic. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> the only thing that, that holds me back. So tell us a little bit. So we're going to deviate listeners um, from our usual talk that we, we do, because Catherine's story is absolutely fascinating and unique, and I really want to highlight her story. So tell us mm-hmm. what got you to Alaska, because I've already started to read your book. And by the time the listeners hear this, your book will be out. It's your debut book. So tell us just a little bit about what get, what got you there. I was a child at a young age. Uh, as an avid reader, I s- absorbed everything I could read. And I think for me, that's what that's what did it for me. I, I picked up these books from many adventurers, uh, the notable one being Arctic Daughter. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I dreamed of Alaska and I dreamed of the far north and the wildness that was up there in this untapped beauty. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I I wanted to go up there. Um, And I read books about the the dog sledding and eating caribou and the the bush pilots that were up there. Mm -hmm. The dry cabins where you had to haul your own water and chop your own wood. And the dream of that was intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while, you know, until I was you know, old age of 20. So, <laughs> get up there. <laughs> so old at 20, I tell you. <laughs> yes. And once I did, uh, there was no going back. Once I crossed into the state, uh, just for the summer, I thought, um, then I, uh, I could never leave for more than, you know, a month or so at a time. Oh, that's a fantastic. I tried to leave the state. But yeah, yeah. Not permanently. Alaska's your home. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How wonderful. And then you alluded a little bit, you know, you were intrigued about um, dog sledding and that is a big part of your life and your story, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, Just starting to read your book and in your introduction to your dog team. And I'm a huge dog fanatic. Um, Absolutely adore dogs. I have two rescues and I'll always have rescues. Um, And So tell us a little bit about how that got started for you, because I can, I mean, I'm sure if you're living in Alaska, it's something that probably is very common knowledge. People, you know, see dogs sledding a lot, but for the rest of us in the lower states of the United States, it's not a common thing for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, growing up in Minnesota, Northern Minnesota does have 
some dog races. So I was slightly exposed to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And as a child um, and an innate dog lover, my poor mom was allergic. Oh, no. We weren't (laughs) able to have dogs growing up. But despite that, I would still, she still would... Um, allow that and <laughs> feel so bad for her these days yeah, but yeah. Uh, still I would want multiple rescue dogs mm-hmm, and, uh, mm-hmm. but I think just because I couldn't couldn't have them I kind of blame her because when I was able to have dogs you know then I had 70 <laughs> yeah 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 a I lesson can. to parents out there <laughs> exactly I my husband will relate because I couldn't have a lot of animals growing up but I'm an animal fanatic and he yeah. swears if we ever moved on a farm I would be Noah's Ark and I'd have every rescue animal I could get my hands on him. of course that's my destiny to take care of animals <laughs> so so you wound up with 70 dogs up in Alaska um, but that's not the full part of your story. You you had a whole you have a whole life up there. So share because I don't want people to know too much of your story because I want them to read your book. Um, but share with us what I find interesting is that you literally do you pretty much live off the grid most of the time is how we would explain it. <laughs> well, I did for um, quite a number of years in the middle there. Mm-hmm. But as um, when I did make it up to Alaska um, at at twenty, you know, it, it took a lot of searching um, in between to figure out really what was my place in life. And mm-hmm. everyone on the planet can relate to that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. My uh, travels um, led me, you know, around the U.S. and even throughout the state of Alaska. Um, took me to different different places and to different pursuits. Mm-hmm. And it, even it did take me a while um, to end up in Kotzebue. But once I did, uh, it really was a place that felt like home, which was interesting because why would I feel out of all places in the world at home in Kotzebue? Mm-hmm. And so it is where I met my husband in mm-hmm. Kotzebue and where he was building uh, what we call camps Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of, um, you know, a cabin. It's where people settle and build a subsistence lifestyle, you mm-hmm. know, like a log cabin. Um, and they are locations where there's no roads, you know, no, no way to access other than by boat or by plane or snow machine. Mm-hmm. Um, where at that location, it was instantly home, you know, is a place that to this day, it's really the only place I I consider to be home. And so that sense of place uh, was really this, this beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it's something that I do write about a lot in this book. So Mm -hmm. that location and the lake that that's on um, was really compelling to me. Um, And you, and you had to do, you guys had to do everything. Like there was you had to keep a fire going and you had to go get your food. You couldn't go down the grocery store and pick up food, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, it's uh, about 18 miles from the town of Kotzebue. And we'd have to go back, you know, eight miles to uh, to get wood and five miles to get water. Uh, in the winter, we'd have to go, you know, cut through ice, get water out of the uh uh, river, um, yeah, order groceries in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, for me, um, you know, it, my, my husband did uh, drown. And when he did, that left me as a single mother with a young baby to sort of manage all of those on my own. Mm-hmm. And those were some hard lessons uh, to learn, you know, managing all of that. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, you consider back through the ages of of women on the frontier of America. Mm-hmm. And, you mm-hmm. know, you've got to imagine what yeah. that would have been like for people yeah. to have to raise not just one child but but many. And yeah, it's, it's, you just have to uh, admire those, those women. I thought about that frequently. Oh, I'm sure you did. And it's it's funny you say that because when you were talking about, it, I was thinking about my women's literature class that that I took years ago in college. And we we did a whole survey of pioneer women's actual history, not the one that you see in in um, 
Hollywood versions, but the real actual history of from accounts of women, there was far more women that were traveling alone throughout the Oregon Trail and coming, you know, in the pioneer lives, living alone with children than I ever imagined, because they would often have husbands that would pass or desert them, and they would stay and they would have to do absolutely everything <laughs> and, and raise their children. So, so it, it it's a testament to strength of women <laughs> that I don't think we celebrate enough <laughs> in our society. <laughs> So that's one reason I love your book. So far, I'm like, I love the fact that you do share your struggles and you also share, you know, a strength about you. And you really draw on the fact that the wilderness is a huge part of strength for you. Can you share a little bit of that with our readers that haven't read the book yet? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my primary reason for writing the book was exactly what you're alluding to that, you know, all of us. In, in life, we, we should be fully engaging with it to the greatest extent possible. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us might not want to admit it, but at, during certain points of life, we find ourselves really just existing. Mm-hmm. When things happen in our life, tragedy may strike and we walk around in shock or mm-hmm. we may be numb for periods of time. Mm-hmm. And so this book... Um, I, I wrote this because I think it's important that we find the grit and resolve mm-hmm. uh, to fight our way back to this surface. And for me, it was through these adventures in the wilderness, um, through the solitude, um, through the dog mushing, the triathlons, um, the, that hiking, that helped me find that grit um, mm-hmm. that gave me the fighting spirit to stop being numb, you know, it helped me feel again, Mm -hmm. that I could crawl out of that numbness and remember that this life is pretty amazing. There is Mm -hmm. a lot to this life that is worth really being awake for. And those wilderness quests and being outside is my way. It's, It's what I live for. It's what I love. And for everyone, you know, individual people have their own things that make mm-hmm. them feel alive. Mm-hmm. It might be sailing, it might be skiing, you know, people have things that they're passionate about. And, you know, I just encourage everyone to find that, find their way and make that a priority in your life. I love that. And that's definitely what I'm so listeners, I got an advanced copy of the book. Woohoo. <laughs> and so I started reading it. And it's definitely a very valuable lesson. And probably the reason why I'm so super excited that you wrote the book, because it's it's a theme I love to have authors come on the podcast and talk about to live your best life and to live awake and and live authentically. But I don't believe any of us can go through that without so severe trials. <laughs> I don't think you can appreciate what you've been given until you know what you've lost <laughs> at some point, you know, so, so it's absolutely wonderful book. So we didn't even say the title of the book. So why don't you share with us the title of the book? And then we'll talk a little bit about the journey for you of writing this, this whole story um, in the format that you have it. So share with us the title, Catherine. The title is Epic Solitude. Uh, And the tagline is that it's a story of survival and a quest for meaning in the far north. And the structure of the book is that it oscillates between those epic adventures that we're talking about and raw life. Mm -hmm. So it's not a sequential book. It doesn't go, you know, at the, you know, birth through, you know, my age of 40. Um, But it goes back and forth. Uh, and it parallels, you know, the adventures sort of parallel where the um, the current stage of 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 life and the um, you know the feeling and the context mm-hmm. of the, where the story is at. Mm-hmm. And so that brings up one question that I have about your writing process. Because um, I did you keep journals throughout your life growing up? Um, how did you remember the details? I'm sure that some of the details of your journeys with, you know, your dog sledding and stuff were probably seared in your mind, easy to remember. But other details around your life, did, how did you remember everything to write it? 
So since I was a teenager, about 12, I wrote in 25 cent notebooks. Oh, yeah. At a rate of once every week, maybe sometimes once a month. Mm -hmm. So, and I filled them up all the way until I was, um, until the loss of my husband. Mm -hmm. I was a frantic journal writer. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And when I lost, um, actually, since since I lost my daughter, and interestingly, when that happened, I I stopped writing completely. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't Mm -hmm. journaled since, uh, since I started writing this book. Uh, So something in me at that point shut off completely. I I couldn't write anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was uh, too much. I just snapped. Mm -hmm. So I did write uh, uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. So when I started writing the book and putting together a timeline, I was able to go back through the journals and um, pick through uh, and find dates and Mm -hmm. um, descriptions of kind of where I was at at the time. Mm -hmm. And I could find a lot of material. And of course, none of the writings could cross over into the book, but at least I could get a sense of where I was at at the time, uh, which was extraordinarily uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. The challenge was for me recreating the period of time um, from uh, when I was 23 on. Uh There was nothing in writing. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So did did you feel like writing the story from the point of when you were 23 on? Cause it's such a powerful story. Do you feel like that? I mean, how did you get started to writing again? Cause you stopped. Right. And then you really had the desire to share your story. How, did you have moments where you had that self doubt of like, yeah, I can't do this. I can't share this. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I had doubt. I still have doubt. <laughs> Oh, it's such a powerful story. But I think all authors do have doubts, even after it's printed and out, right? <laughs> um, so when I started writing, um, I I forced myself to get it back into the habit of writing um, just a thousand words a day. I just, mm-hmm. whether it was nonsense or it was all nonsensical type of writing, just to write, uh, just get the words flowing. And before long, the flowing of words um, began to uh, help beginning to express feeling. And then from there, it began to go from feeling to beginning to write narrative, mm-hmm. which are two entirely different things. Mm-hmm. And, and from there, going from the journaling and the narrative and from there, beginning to write the book proposal and the actual book, you know, that was definitely um, a, a very big learning process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. I'm glad you, you brought that part up. But before I jump into the actual aspect of you getting a proposal out and getting the story actually picked up, you know, and, and it for the publisher and stuff. Um, I wanted to touch on the part of, I, I've said it with, I've interviewed, I'm going about 85 authors now of interviewing them and from all different walks of life and all different journeys, parts of their journey. And the one thing that we all have found is that writing has saved our lives at one point or another through journaling, through sharing our emotions. And then eventually it gets to the place of where, okay, now we're, we're, we're getting healed so that we can start telling the stories that are, you know, we want to tell, you know, either fiction or, or or um, personal stories like yours. So I love the fact that that you did pick it back up because now your book will be coming out to share your story with so many other people that I think will be inspiring. So I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you found it again. Um, so Catherine, share with us. So you you are traditionally published. I have a lot of authors that come on at different kinds of publishing, self-publishing, traditional um, published. And I love to ask questions around that so that there's, I have a lot of listeners that um, are at the stage of maybe becoming published or they want to become published. And that's how this whole podcast got started is that I'm working towards publication. And so I started to ask authors around me, how did you get published? <laughs> so, so kind of walk us through that. You started, did you start with the idea that you're going to be traditional published or what was your thinking or did you just go for it and, 
and, uh, and wanted to see what happened. I had hoped to go the traditional uh, route and I was very lucky to uh, uh, be able to, you know, right off the bat, I found an agent that Mm -hmm. could help me along with that process. There was um, an article that was written through ESPN and that generated a lot of interest for a project um, of some sort uh, to be created. Mm -hmm. And that led to um, the agent through Curtis Brown, mm-hmm. uh, Jonathan Lyons, bless his soul. <laughs> say, you know, yeah, I'll, I would be willing to uh, help you get a book written. And I have no idea why he said that because huh. I've never written a book. So he has stuck with me through the end and uh, has walked me through the process and you know, now we have a, a, a book out there, but uh, once uh, we, once I had him by my side, uh, you know, the next step was to get the book proposal written. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that took a very long time to get that done. And he helped me get uh, in touch with a um, coach, a writing coach. Oh, wonderful. Which made a very big difference because it would have been difficult for me to put all of that together without mm-hmm. her help. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the biggest hurdle with the memoir was just going through the timeline and uh, figuring out how best to organize uh, this memoir and making the decisions between sequentially or, you know, how, how we wanted to sequence this um, or the oscillating, you know, uh-huh. nature that it is. So the, Having a, a coach, if I, you can, I, I think that made a big difference as a new author. And um, uh, it, it took about uh, six months to finish the proposal. That's that's actually great because it's taking me over a year to write the first draft of my book. So. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I love, I love the fact that, so I want to back up a little bit, because I'm not sure if my listeners heard um, how it worked for you. Every journey that I have on here, every author is so different, but yours is so unique that, so you are um, what I would consider an athlete. So you were at, you were interviewed for ESPN and were you in the New York times as well before you before you were approached to tell your story in a written book form? I have been in the New York Times, yeah. uh, but that wasn't related to the ESPN. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And then they came knocking at your door, which I find fascinating because most of us authors are like trying to bust the door down of an agent to find, you know, get their attention. So you you have you had the beautiful story that brought them to you, which is wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah, and I and I love the fact that you talked about, you know it being a partnership with your agent and also, you know, really needing a writing coach. Cause I often ask authors that come on, you know, what was your support group around the writing process for you? You know, for you, did, you know, was your coach your only support group or were there some people in the area that you could spend time with in a writer's group? Unfortunately, Kotzebue is a small town and Mm -hmm. a little isolating. So I would say, you know, I had a family that's very supportive, mm-hmm. but the technical aspects of writing the book, you know, I had limited support. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine that being in the location you're in, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. So that's, that's awesome. So I very cool. Say again, my family was extremely supportive. Yeah. My mom and a sister, I could send them. Draft I was going to say, did, did you read, did they read it ahead of time? They would read it and edit it and send me back their thoughts. Yeah, my si- my sisters. They were, I mean, I had a lot of support with that, so I'm eternally grateful. I love that, and you know, I I think that well, one thing that we're really blessed with in our times is that we have technology to help us, right? So we're not so isolated that you can, you know, send 
um, drafts and parts to family members that don't live near you, but they can fill in pieces of the story and help you fill in pieces. That's the one thing that I love about sharing my work with my family is that they they know me so well that they know kind of where I'm going with something. And if, if I'm translating that in words well enough... <laughs> for everybody else. So, so that that's fantastic. Well, I love it. So I have, um, well, let me ask you this question this way. Um, you've done a tremendous amount of, um, isolated work where you're, where you're dog sledding with the dogs and you're isolated from human contact. Right. Um, and oftentimes we have authors talk about the writing process as being incredibly isolating and we have to force ourselves to, get involved with other people to make it um, valuable, you know, to get the input that we need and stuff. Can, can you kind of compare the two of being out with your dogs and the writing journey? Did you feel like one, I'm sure they're very, very different, right? But is there one that was better for you than the other? Would you say that writing was easier for you than actually doing the dog, <laughs> you know, sledding and the journeys that you've done with that? Or was the dog, the dog sledding and the, the um, races that you were in, were they easier than writing? To be honest, I'm going to say they are exactly the same. See, and I was I, wondering. <laughs> to be, uh, not, and not that I can give out any spoilers, but to those that will read the book, when you are out there in a dog team uh, in the middle of nowhere and you are five days in and you haven't slept and you're emotionally drained, um, you hit kind of rock bottom and your soul is, you know, about ready to break and the past, you know, comes in and uh, is it's, it's on top of you and you're ready to cry and scream and you have nowhere to go with it. You're just stuck with it. And that's very similar to when you're there on your computer and you're writing and you have to go through every, you're, you're there in the moment and you have to explain that to your readers, what it's like to relive the worst moment of your life. And you have to explain what it felt like, what what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what it tastes like, uh, you know, you're, you're there in the moment. And, and I would say the isolation and the pain and the, everything is very similar because you're locked in, in that moment. And it, it, it felt very, very similar. And the after effects of both felt very similar uh, on the dog team and the dog sled races, you know, it's, it takes like days after that for the soul to recover from those experiences. They're very cathartic. And it's, after that, it's a sense of, uh, you know, the healing does come when you have those moments. Um, you're, there is a, a lightness that comes and similar to when you're writing and you get through that moment um, you know, that layer of the onion does come off each time you have to write and rewrite and rewrite those especially difficult sections. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very similar. I would have to say. I love it. And, and I would think it comes down to the, the actual, you know, one of the messages that you really have is that, you know, sharing the aspect that, that, we have to find that grit in us to continue, even when we really don't feel like it. Emotionally, we're just done, right? <laughs> and so, so, um, so awesome. Thank you for sharing that because I was curious, you know, as as I was thinking about our interview and reading about the races and and the isolation of the races. You know, you you put yourself in that situation, just like most of us writers will put ourselves in the situation of writing and going through that journey. Most of us will give up. You know, most people that start writing don't continue. <laughs> but when you're out on a race of dogs in the wilderness in the snow, you can't give up. You have to keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so wonderful. So let's dig in. Um, my listeners absolutely love the readings from authors. And so um, that's one of my special um, favorite parts about the interviews, too, because I can sit back and listen to your voice sharing with us in the world what you've written. So let's set the stage for that. Um, again. 
Um, you, I give you the choice to read what you want, but you can set whatever you need to around that um, to help the context. Um, but I really hope that uh, we don't tell too much because I want everybody to go out and buy your book because it's already so good, guys. I've read a few chapters and it's fantastic. <laughs> so Catherine, set the stage for us and, and share with us some of your reading. Great. Well, um, I elected to read one of the very first chapters of the book. I'm on the Iditarod Trail, mile 777, and I'm in Unicleet, Alaska in 2014, which is my uh, rookie year. So my very uh, first year doing the Iditarod uh, race. And the Iditarod is 1,049 miles And I'm reading this particular section because um, it does help. um, There's um, terms in here that are defined, whereas if I picked one later on in the book, uh, you might not quite understand what it is that I'm talking about. When it comes to cold, the crossroads of crisis and necessity is 45 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. At 20 or even 30 degrees below zero, we can maintain our body temperature so long as we wear the proper gear. But deeper than 30 below, no gear suffices to counteract the cold. Not even the four layers on my legs and feet, the six on my torso, the work gloves, and two sets of hand warmers inside my mushroom mitts, and the wool bullock lava and liner on my head, all topped off with a goofy-looking beaver fur hat. I'm just a poor boy, nobody loves me. I sing out, trying to stay awake to my dogs who march off like heroes down the trail. The dogs are used to my off-key singing by now and don't seem disturbed by my choice in music. Cowboy, take me away. Take me high and above to see the stars. I cry out, making up the Dixie Chick lyrics as I go. Because, despite this being my favorite song, my sleep-deprived brain can't quite recall the correct words. The dogs don't seem to mind. I am seven days and 750 miles into my first I did a rod, the thousand-mile dog sled race across Alaska. I started the race with 14 dogs and have dropped five at the checkpoints for various reasons. Nine dogs remain, with over 250 miles yet to travel. Just as we leave Unicleet at 40 below zero, The Weather Service issues a winter storm warning with a high wind advisory. There is only one option, keep moving. We trek over the uh, bare blueberry hills, rising away from Unicleet over the Bering Sea. I hope for snow to smooth the way, but find none. Covered with sand and rocks and patches of glare ice, the climbs through the hills are long and arduous. After 18 miles, we reach the high point of this section with a steep climb. I scream out in frustration as the dogs slip around on ice while the sled sticks on sand. We cannot move. How are we supposed to do this? Inch by inch, I push the sled forward until the dogs can get off the ice. Their attitudes are positive and the dogs march on once they get traction. After about 28 miles, we reach the top of Blueberry Hills, an 850 foot high view with Shack Tulip visible from 12 miles away. The winds create an effect from the ground storm and combined with the sunset to give the area a glorious golden fog bank. I've traveled along enough Arctic coastline to know this fog bank will not be as heavenly to travel through as it appears. I understand how difficult traveling can be between the poor visibility, large drifts, glare ice and low temperatures but I don't hesitate. And we start the three mile descent down into that fog bank at an alarming rate without the ability to stop, careening toward the ground blizzard. A 40 mile per hour quartering headwind howls at us from the north, combining with the 40 below temperatures to create a dangerous chill factor of minus 84 degrees Fahrenheit. In bad conditions, 12 miles is a long way to go. The wind and cold take a toll on all of us. Mile after mile, I stand on the footboards of my sled, packed with a minimum of tools and supplies we need to sustain us. My on-sled dance routine consists of kicks, squats, and any other movement I can think of to warm my extremities. Up, up, I yell in a scratchy voice, followed by, Oh, pirates, yes, they rob I, so light to the merchant ships. I am in my element, having the time of my life. I can sing out wrong words and all, and there is no one within miles to care. 
My team of Alaskan Huskies, a cross between the Siberian Husky and German short-haired pointer, run in two lines stretching out ahead of me, secured to each other and the sled with two dog harnesses. <laughs> These connect to a gang line and a long cable that attaches the harnesses to the sled. We leave the shelter of trees and bushes behind. The trail follows a slough into Shaktulik. The lack of snow results in a glass ice rink on the coast. We try to navigate the glare ice, but without traction, the wind pushes the sled sideways off the trail and spins it around the team. Joy and Summit, my experienced leaders, handle the situation effectively. At last, we see the buildings of old Czech Tulik, which indicate we are close to the checkpoint. Nice day, huh? The Czech Tulik checker says. Gorgeous, I reply. In a more serious tone, he says. The storm will increase in intensity. What are you going to do? I ask a veteran racer and Admiral Bowmusher, Paige Drombey, nervous rookie that I am. Proceed into the storm or raid it out in Shaktulik for the next couple of days? My question is leading. I am eager to lead Shaktulik. The dogs can't rest well at this checkpoint due to the lack of shelter from the wind, Paige says. If we leave soon enough, we might beat the worst of the storm and make it to Koyuk, which has better shelter to rest the dogs. I make my choice. It's time to go. I leave with two hours rest on the dogs. I soon regret that choice. Leaving Czech Tulik, Paige and I put our ice cleats on and walk in front of our teams, leading them across glare ice that neither human nor dog can gain traction on. It takes a long time to leave Czech Tulik. The winds increase harder and faster than predicted. There is no beating this storm. We struggle to see the next trail marker. I stop my sled, flip it over to act as a brake, and walk in front of the dogs to locate the stake. We continue in this fashion, crawling one stake to the next. Fifteen miles out, the trail changes course to head around a spit of land. This abrupt turn is unmarked because Wind and other dog teams have knocked down the trail stakes. My team can't find the trail, and if the tracks are any proof, neither could many others. Heading toward uh, land over a mile of glare ice, the dogs face a crosswind. Our plight changes from tough to very serious when the wind gusts, now over 60 miles per hour, blow my sled and the entire team sideways over 100 miles, 100 yards over the ice. I have little to no control over the situation. The conditions scare my leaders, and they can no longer guide the team. They can't even hear my commands over the howling wind. We are on the ice, unable to move. We crawl around the ice in circles, searching for the trail. For every foot we gain in the right direction, we lose another 10. I need to reevaluate my decision to proceed to Koya and create a strategy that retains the greatest number of options to get my team through the night. This is now a life-threatening situation. Paige is ahead of me. Her dogs travel faster than mine. No teams will leave from Shack Tulip behind us. Thoughts of the race drop away. Time to survive. As the reality of my predicament sinks in, I think of my daughter, Amelia, who is now in sixth grade and drown in regret and guilt over having put myself, her only living parent, in this life-or-death situation. Wet from sweat, I lead the dogs toward land inch by inch. No help is on the way. I am alone out here. During a momentary break in the visibility, I see a shelter cabin in the distance that could offer protection from the wind. We head toward it and I review our choices. If we make it to the cabin, we can stay there, but only for a short time because of a limited amount of dog food. Soon we will be forced back to Shack Tulik or on to Koyuk. I worry about getting separated from the dogs. I get off the sled, walk in front of the leaders, and line out the team to locate a trail stake. A wind gust pushes the sled away from me on the ice. I panic as the dogs slide farther away. I run after them. The wind pushes me with such aggression that I fall over and slam my head against the ice. Dazed, I look around, not knowing where I am. I can't see farther than a few feet in any direction. All I can do is follow the wind and hope it leads me to the dogs. 
my head foggy, I stumble along until I hear barking in the distance. Is that my imagination? I alter my course until I spot the team. The dog settled on a patch of snow solid enough to allow my overturned sled to get traction and stop. The dogs wag their tails in enthusiasm as I walk up to the leaders. I sit there for a while hugging them, seeking to convey a confidence I don't have. Between gusts of wind, I see the form of the bluff where the shelter cabin is. I consider stopping here to get into my sled bag, seven feet long and two feet wide, with room to expand. I am drenched in sweat from the labor, but my body temperature drops as soon as I stop moving. My shivering signals the onset of hypothermia. We must keep moving. The dogs need better protection. It is worth another try to make it to the shelter cabin before we resort to bagging it for the night. After another hour, we make it to the bluff. I drive the team to the back side of the cabin and out of the wind. I walk inside to discover there is no wood for the stove, and it rips away any hope I have of drying out. What do I do? I can't think. <coughs> I have heat for the fuel, but no stove nearby to melt for water. I provide the dogs with a snack of dry commercial dog food and frozen meat, which they inhale. The back of the cabin offers little shelter for the dogs, so I take the females and the male the main leader, Summit, inside the cabin. The leaders need rest to guide us through the storm into Koyuk. The dogs outside nestle in their protective down dog coats, lick off any ice buildup, and fall asleep, while the dogs inside enjoy the break from the game line and settle down in the corners of the shelter cabin. I lay out my sleeping bag on the wood planks of the bunk bed. I have spared dry clothes and shivering. I strip down the layers I can and swap them out. I figured packing all this extra gear was being paranoid, but you never know when you will need it. I jump into my down bag, hoping to warm up. My shivering is so violent that even Ears, whom I invite onto the sleeping bag, jumps off to go lay by her buddy, Summit. I snack the dogs every couple hours, hoping to keep their body temperatures up. I am out of food, having lost that bag on the ice. There is vacuum-sealed food, but without snow to melt in the metal box that serves as a cook pot, I can't thaw it enough to eat. I better remember this lesson well. Weak from cold and hunger, I again review my options. How can we make it another 40 miles to Koyuk, let alone to Nome? With no one else to talk to, I end up in heated discourse with the wind. You know, there are easier ways, I say. Easier ways to find answers. Why don't you tell me? Let's make a deal. I'm happy to negotiate. My voice echoes the words back from the ice like a mirror and hits my heart with their full weight. Over the course of my 40 years, I've weathered my share of extreme temperatures, the baking 100 degree heat that left me nauseated while competing in my first Ironman triathlon, for example, as well as other stamina challenges, including solo hiking, 1,100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. Endurance pursuits became my way of recovering from the series of traumas that sent me wandering across the country. What I was searching for, I couldn't always say. Escape, relief, distraction, answers, grace, a restoration of faith in the universe. At times, these, more, and none. My spiritual nature sought the energy field vortexes in Sedona, drummed during sun dances in New Mexico, and sweated through vision quests in Arizona. At last, my wanderings took me home. I envisioned for myself at 10 years old, Bush, Alaska, the last frontier. 15 years after driving an ice cream truck from my childhood home in Minneapolis to Alaska to experience Arctic life, I am alone in the vast wilderness, trapped in the solitude I craved for as long as I remember, just to sled my dogs and me. The lack of response to my attempt at negotiation disappoints. Super, I say with a tight, flat voice, looking down at my swollen, frozen fingers. Ears, have you figured it out yet? I ask, 
painful emotion swells in my throat, making it difficult to speak. My tired, windburned eyes look to hers, eyes that reflect pure, unconditional love and adoration. Yeah, okay, you're right, I say. Might as well sleep for now. The answer is down the trail somewhere. We stay there for over 12 hours waiting for an opportunity to leave. The wind shakes the shelter cabin all night, letting up 10 o'clock the next morning. The visibility is still less than a quarter mile. The dogs are running out of food, so we need to keep moving. I hook them up and we make our way to Koyak. Travel is difficult and slow. I switch out the leaders every hour to keep them fresh. Storms bring in large snow drifts between the patches of glare ice, which takes a toll on the team. All we must do is make it to the next trail marker. Find the next stake, go after the next stake, make it to the next stake, and search for the one after that. Because if I don't, this will be the last one I ever find. Bravo, Catherine. I love it. Um, I actually felt like I was there <laughs> with you. Um, so beautiful writing. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, so before we head out of the podcast today, with all your experiences, you've, you've gone through so much in your life and you've, you've done such amazing um, athletic things. And then you wrote a book. So share with our listeners that are working their way towards their goal of being published one tidbit of um, encouragement or something you can share with us as we work our way through our journey. That is an excellent question. Um, The biggest advice I would have is push through the doubt. That's uh, no matter your background, your experience, how much you may or may not know about being a writer, just keep writing. You uh, can get You can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. Just uh, keep writing. That's my biggest advice. It's pretty simple. Find the resources that you need uh, and keep working towards your goal. But you have to keep working towards your goal. If you walk away from it, um, if you don't apply yourself, it's not going to happen. So every day you have to do something that's working towards your goal and you have to believe in yourself. That's my advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing um, that with us and sharing your story. And I wish you all the best with this book. So listeners, I sure hope that you have been captivated by um, Catherine's story as I've been and go on to our show notes and find her website, purchase her book, email her, let her know, or find her on Instagram or Facebook, let her know that you heard her on the podcast and you got the book and share with her um, what you felt about it. And Catherine, thank you so much for being here. And I, I have a feeling I'm going to see you on some national stages as this book comes out. (laughs) Oh, thanks, Vicki. And thanks everyone out there for listening. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. Follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter where you can be entered automatically each month to win a signed free copy of a book from an author that's appeared on the podcast. You can find out more at our website, www.squishpin.com. And finally, if you're an author in the Pacific Northwest and you would like to appear on the show, you can find out more on our website. So until next week, I hope you enjoy the journey. This is Vicki J. Carter signing off.